Today, over the last few days, there's been various reports about a new NATO strategy to confront Russia, a NATO strategy which we have not seen because it's not been published, but which we have been told by various NATO officials, including the German defence minister, will include more um, willing, ready use of unconventional weapons, such as um, electronic warfare systems, um, possible cyber weapons, and of course, nuclear weapons. And this strategy is supposed to deter Russian threats by developing a wargaming strategy for NATO, which will extend all the way from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Note that there is no reference here to the Arctic or the North Atlantic, which in my opinion is the real point of confrontation between NATO and Russia, and where the Russians are steadily increasing their strategic advantage. They're in fact increasing their strategic advantage in other places too. They are rapidly building up their conventional forces. They have now perfected the logistical uh, um, systems to mobilize large numbers of troops in extremely short time frames and to develop and they've also developed the command and control systems to do that and in addition and this year they're going to start re-equipping these troops with ever increasing numbers of more sophisticated weapons which we're going to start to see from now on appearing in much greater quantities. Now there's been a great deal of talk about these weapons. The Russians displayed early versions of them or prototype versions of them as long ago as the 2015 military parade on Red Square. One remembers the T-14 Armata tank, the boomerang, um, uh, wheeled um, infantry fighting vehicle, the Kurganets tracked infantry fighting vehicle, the Koalitsia um, self-propelled 152mm gun, and various other weapon systems of that kind. Now, there's been much discussion and commentary about why these vehicles, these, these samples of military equipment, haven't yet appeared in any quantity. The reality is that when they were displayed on Red Square in, um, in 2015, during the Victory Day Parade, what we were being shown were only the earliest prototypes. In other words, not just not exactly mock-ups, but vehicles that were there simply to display what was to come rather than operational vehicles. The Russians did make all kinds of claims and reports at the time that these weapon systems would be very quickly ready for production. But it's quite obvious that that wasn't, in fact, the case at all. So why did the Russians do that in May 2015? Well, the short answer was that in May 2015, there was still a major standoff with the West over uh, the situation in eastern Ukraine and Crimea. Military tensions were very severe, and the Russians needed to make a show of force to try to give both their own people encouragement that Russia would have the, we the weapon systems necessary to withstand the West and also to give the Western powers something to think about if they were intending to launch some kind of military attack on Russia. In reality, as I said, in 2015, as anybody who is familiar with weapons development would be able would have realised, and as the logistics made absolutely clear, these weapon systems were far from ready for production. In fact, they were very much at the early stage of their development phase. But the information now is that these weapon systems are now at the end of their development phase and that some of them are starting to enter service. So we've had reports that about a, a, a score of Armata T-14 tanks have now been um, developed and produced and are being supplied to the ground troops. And there's 
growing indications that the boomerang wheeled vehicle is um, about to enter service also. During the recent Zapad 2021 um, military exercise, two Russian units equipped with some of these weapon systems, apparently the Kurganets tracked vehicle and the boomerang wheeled vehicle, actually participated in the exercise, which is a clear indication that these weapon systems are now entering service and will be entering service very soon. And in addition to these weapon systems, which were deployed, uh, or rather displayed for the first time in May 20 2015, there are other weapon systems that seem to be coming into service also. The Russians have made a major program of developing both unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, drones, if you prefer, but they've also invested heavily in developing robot-type uh, uh, ground-based vehicles, and these also seem to be on the brink of entering service, or perhaps not yet of entering service, but at least they're being prepared for production and factories have been built in order to produce them in quantity. So it's likely that perhaps in a couple of years' time, we will start to see more of these weapon systems also appearing. The point is that NATO had nothing to match these systems when some of these systems were displayed for the first time in May 2015, and they've had, they have nothing to uh, show in response to these systems Today, either there's been various programs and plans for new tanks and new armoured vehicles in the West, but so far, nothing that has even uh, approached the kind of prototype level that the Russians displayed back in 2015. And as I said, it takes decades, at least a decade, to get um, um, equipment of this kind into production so it's going to take a long time, I suspect, for these systems to enter production in the West too. But anyway, the priority of the Russians during this period, since that um, May 2015 parade, was not, I think, to bring these systems into service or to bring them into service in a hurry. It was to develop their command and control systems, their logistical systems, their mobilization techniques, and to transition large parts of their ground forces from a conscript based uh, uh, system into a professional force, which has now, to a great extent, been achieved. The result is a very high upgrade of Russian military capabilities in Europe with much greater proficiency um, ab amongst the troops and amongst the units, much better command and control, much more stress-tested command and control, and also, as I said, a very advanced logistical operation behind them, none of which existed on anything like the scale back in 2014, when the Ukrainian crisis began. Now, this has been a major source of concern because, as I said, NATO doesn't have the troops or the resources to match this Russian build-up on Russia's borders, in, on Russia's border areas. But, of course, it's all been massively complicated, further still, by developments much further east. As I've discussed in video after video, the United States is now faced with a naval challenge from China in the Pacific. The Chinese are building aircraft carriers, they're developing advanced anti-ship missiles, they've been uh, making strides in submarine warfare, and they might be getting help from the Russians to develop their submarine warfare. They've built helicopter um, carriers, which are suited for amphibious operations. They've upgraded their marine forces, their naval infantry forces, and they've also developing a very powerful air force on the Chinese mainland to back all of these forces in a clash on the Taiwan Straits 
and in the South and East China Seas. And of course, as I've discussed in recent programmes, when I've discussed the Chinese silo building programme and the latest test by China of a hypersonic glide vehicle, they're also busy upgrading their nuclear strategic force. And the United States is faced in the Pacific region, therefore, with a major growth of Chinese power and a situation where the United States has apparently made commitments to various countries, including, I suspect, I strongly suspect, to Taiwan, to defend them from China, but where the United States is finding it increasingly difficult to develop the resources to do it, to find the resources in terms of naval power and air, air power in order to do it. So the United States has been seeking to try and redirect some of its military assets, which have been positioned in Europe and in the Middle East towards the Pacific region. This was a doctrine first discussed by Barack Obama all the way back in 2009, when he talked about a pivot to Asia. This seems to have been very much the American policy, to try to transfer assets and resources from Europe and the Middle East to confront China in Asia. And this has gone hand in hand with a concerted US attempt to find allies, countries like Australia and Britain, and also some of the Asian states, such as Vietnam and the Philippines, and of course Japan, to stand with them in the confrontation against China, which the United States is facing in the Pacific. However, there are clearly problems. First of all, there is the problem that some of these countries in the Pacific seem unenthusiastic about joining the United States in this alliance against China. We have seen that US attempts to win over Vietnam have been a complete failure. The Vietnamese have gone out of their way to reassure China that they are not interested in joining any kind of US military alliance directed at China. There was that extraordinary deal between the United States, Britain and Australia to set up this AUKUS alliance system. And the United States has also agreed alongside Britain to provide Australia with nuclear weapons technology in order to enable Australia to build its own nuclear submarines. The problem is that the AUKUS alliance has alarmed some of the other countries that the United States has been wanting to win over. It's dismayed India, which senses that it's being relegated by the United States to a second string player in the confrontation with China in the Asia Pacific region. And India has found recently that it's got a very difficult problem with China on its border. And this must be causing concern in New Delhi and also questions about whether Delhi, whether India can indeed rely on the United States in a crisis with China. And of course, other countries, including Japan, have also become increasingly concerned. And we've seen that the new Japanese Prime Minister, Prime Minister Kishida, took a first step when he was Prime Minister of telephoning the Chinese President Xi Jinping and trying to find some way of exploring some kind of relaxation of tensions with China. So there's been problems with some of the US's Pacific allies or potential allies. But there's also been perhaps even more serious problems with Europe. Firstly, the AUKUS deal, the submarine deal, has infuriated France. France has felt cut out. It has large Pacific territories that the United States and Britain do not have. And it questions why the United States should therefore prefer an alliance with Australia and Britain over an alliance with France in the Pacific. And the French were also infuriated that the United States and Britain secretly negotiated a submarine deal with Australia, which um, torpedoed a French submarine deal with Australia. 
and didn't consider the possibility that that French submarine deal with Australia might have been upgraded to provide Australia with French nuclear submarine technology, thus pro protecting France's deal with Australia and at the same time upgrading Australia's capabilities to provide Australia with nuclear submarines. So the French were furious. They recalled their ambassadors from uh, uh, the United States and Australia and President Macron of France remains extremely aggrieved by this conduct of the United States, despite receiving a conciliatory comment, uh, a call from US President Biden, who tried to uh, appease him and who actually apologised to Macron for the way in which the United States secretly negotiated the AUKUS and nuclear submarine deals with Australia. But France, though a major problem, also doesn't deal with the United States' further problem, which is that just as the United States has made commitments to various countries like Taiwan and Japan and South Korea in the Pacific, which the steady and remorseless growth of Chinese power, and by the way, the growth of North Korean military power to a certain extent also, make increasingly difficult for the United States to honour. So the United States has made commitments to various East European states also, including, of course, commitments that were made to various East European states that now form part of NATO and which the United States is therefore treaty-bound to defend in the event of a war with Russia. So the United States has found that these East European states, which, to say it straightforwardly, are not very interested in China, which for them is far away and which they are see, do not tend to see as a major threat, the, uh, these East European states have been concerned that the new renewed American focus on China is taking away US support from, from them, support which they feel they need, given the rapid growth of Russian military power, which is what ultimately concerns them. So how to square this circle? How to get the Europeans on board with the challenge against China? How to reassure the Europeans? How, indeed, to get European help in the struggle against China. We've seen that the British are prepared to send some warships to the Pacific. It's significant, though, that support is. But we see that it's become extremely difficult to get other European states to provide uh, um, equipment, troops, naval power to the Pacific in any quantity. It's be been difficult to get them to provide even token support well, the answer is the, uh, that the United States and the NATO leadership, people like Jens Stoltenberg, have tried to square this circle by reassuring the East Europeans and other NATO countries, for example, the British, that the, the United States is now emphasising the conflict with China it is going to also simultaneously maintain the strong posture against Russia. And we have, the result, as a result, that extraordinary statement which I discussed from Jens Stoltenberg the other day, a statement made over the course of an interview with the Financial Times, in which Jens Stoltenberg talked about NATO facing a global security challenge, one which encompasses Europe, the Arctic, the North Atlantic, the Pacific, Russia and China and all sorts of other points in the compass in between, all at the same time, and the need by NATO to confront all of them simultaneously. And how to do that? Well, there are only finite resources. And this is, I think, something that Americans 
find very difficult to accept because until fairly recently, the United States was able to be strong everywhere against potential adversaries at the same time. The United States, 20 years ago, possessed what was by far the world's biggest economy. It was at the centre of the world financial system. The dollar was the world's reserve currency. It could outspend and outmatch any power or grouping of powers anywhere in the world, seemingly without effort. But those days have passed. Russia has recovered from its 1990s crisis and China has boomed. And in aggregate, the Chinese and the Russians can match the United States in terms of financial, uh, economic and natural resources. And they're actually able to exceed them in manufacturing and industrial ones. So this has been a major problem. Moreover, it's clear that the Russians and the Chinese are working together far more effectively in terms of military cooperation than is the United States and its erstwhile allies. We've just had that joint task force that the Russians and the Chinese have uh, uh, put together and which sailed through the Japanese home islands, for example. And we understand it is now becoming clear, in fact, that Russian Chinese naval air patrols will shortly be supplemented by joint Russian Chinese naval patrols in the Northern Pacific, with quite possibly joint task forces being sent all around the world to confront the United States and its allies in various places in times of crisis. So the United States is facing a major commitments crisis, but it has just committed itself, nonetheless, despite this crisis, to remain strong everywhere, to defend Taiwan. We've had that extraordinary comment by President Biden that the United States is committed to the defense of Taiwan. And I discussed in a recent program that that was not, in fact, a slip of the tongue, though the Chinese don't take that claim very seriously because they see that the United States lacks the military power to, for to see that through. And the United States, of course, continues to have commitments that it's made to various East European states. And, of course, General Austin has just travelled through Eastern Europe. He's been to Ukraine, to Georgia, to Romania, where he's appeared to reaffirm US commitments to these countries in the face of growing Russian power. And, in fact, he's even talked about Russian, uh, sorry, Ukrainian and Georgian membership of NATO at some date. Well, how do you reconcile these various commitments that you are making in the Pacific and in Europe, both at the same time, given that you have finite resources and your opponents, your likely adversaries, the Eurasian powers, China and Russia, likely exceed your resources and will be able to outmatch you before very long. Well, it's fair to say that there's recently been a NATO summit meeting and it's now quite clear what's happened. The United States, as I said, has announced or NATO has announced that it now has this war fighting strategy for taking on the Russians in the Baltic and in the Black Sea. But we learn from Associated Press that there is, in fact, no commitment, no greater commitment, no larger commitment of US ground forces to Europe. In fact, it's difficult to see how such a commitment can be made, given the extent of US commitments around the world, given the finite extent of the US military, and given the overriding focus now on meeting the challenge from China. So what to do in this situation? Well, I'm going to say it straightforwardly. We haven't seen this NATO document, this cunning plan that NATO has put together to contest uh, with Russia, to deter Russia everywhere from the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea. But what we are hearing from NATO officials 
including from the German defence minister, make the nature of the new strategy entirely clear, at least to me. What the United States is proposing to do is to lower the nuclear threshold. In other words, it is basically saying we cannot find the ground forces to match the Russians in Europe at the same time as we're taking on the Chinese in the Pacific. We are struggling to keep up with the Russian naval buildup in the North Atlantic and in the Arctic. And of course, we can't possibly even think about doing that when we're facing this massive naval challenge from the Chinese in the Pacific. We don't have the resources to be strong in both places in conventional terms, and we probably don't have any longer the resources to defend the Baltic states, which are, of course, the most exposed of all. So what we're going to do is we're going to lower the nuclear thresholds. We're going to launch nuclear strikes on Russian troop concentrations in the event that we find ourselves in a conventional standoff and we are facing defeat. And that seems to me to be the great new cunning plan. The plan to take on the Russians is, in effect, a plan to resort to nuclear war. Nuclear war on the European continent. Now, there are fundamental problems with this, but let's first of all take note of the fact that this is an admission that NATO doesn't have the resources any longer to defeat the Russians in conventional warfare in areas close to Russia's borders. So it's essentially an admission that in conventional warfare terms, in terms of conventional war fighting, the Baltic states have now become undefendable. So what we have instead is a refusal, obviously, to compromise or negotiate or deal with the Russians or indeed with the Chinese, to seek that geostrategic ceasefire with others that I've talked about. It's instead the incredibly dangerous step of lowering the nuclear thresholds. But here is the problem. Here is the risk that this strategy involves. I'm going to say it straight away. I don't think the Russians at the moment have the slightest intention of launching a ground offensive against the Baltic states. I see nothing in Russia that hints at any such intention, though no doubt plans exist. General staffs always uh, draw up plans for every eventuality, and quite possibly there is somewhere in the general staff building in Moscow a plan for an invasion and an occupation of the Baltic states. But as I said, I don't believe that this is a plan. I don't believe that this is the intention. I don't think that this is what the Russians intend to do. But the Russians will get the message that the United States is lowering the nuclear threshold, that is preparing to use nuclear weapons to sort itself out of its battlefield problems in the event of a military crisis in Europe. So what are the Russians going to do in response? Well, I'm going to say that the Russians have already been busy, in my opinion, responding to all of this. If you look at some of the steps that the Russians have been taking over the last few years, they give every indication of having been taken precisely in anticipation of the day when the Americans would indeed decide to lower the nuclear thresholds. And what I'm referring to now is development of the Poseidon nuclear powered and uh, a submarine drone and the Burest Venik nuclear-powered cruise missile. Both of these seem to me to be counterforce weapons to deal with precisely this sort of eventuality. They are basically weapon systems that the Russians are developing in order to counter any threat by the United States to use nuclear weapons in Europe 
as part of a, of a strategy of defeating Russian conventional power. And as I have said previously, in that video which I did some months ago, in which I discussed the Poseidon nuclear-powered submarine drone, all it would take, in my opinion, is for the R Russians to deploy this weapon system at sea during a period of crisis, such as we would see if there was some kind of military confrontation in the Baltic states, in um, the Black Sea area, wherever, to fundamentally and dramatically change the geopolitical military strategic picture. Would the United States, in that case, really go nuclear to counter Russian conventional forces if it was faced with the risk of potentially devastating torpedo strikes, drone strikes, underwater drone strikes against the West and East Coast of the United States. Well, I think that the chances of that are very limited indeed. Obviously, the United States could, in that kind of situation, threaten to retaliate with the full weight of its strategic arsenal, but if it did that, the Russians possess a nuclear strategic arsenal at least comparable to that of the United States, and at the moment actually more advanced than that of the United States. And to be straightforward about it, if we were to find ourselves in that situation, the United States would cease to exist, as probably would most of humankind. So I have to say that this threat to build up, to rather to lower the nuclear thresholds in the event of a confrontation with the Russians in Europe, looks to me at the moment both dangerous and one which the Russians could counter and could counter in a way that would make it look like a bluff. Now, I have to say that when it comes to nuclear confrontation, to nuclear weapons policies, it's never, in my opinion, wise to bluff. I think that it's always a good idea, and that's what strategic nuclear deterrent forces are all about, for countries like the United States, China, Russia, to possess nuclear deterrent capabilities, to make it very clear that any country foolish enough or reckless enough to launch an attack on them would face an overwhelming response. It gives countries that kind of security. But to try to go down, to uh, seek to develop nuclear capabilities, to get yourself out of your conventional warfare problems is incredibly dangerous. It could rapidly escalate out of control and it could escalate out of control to your massive disadvantage. The proper way of countering conventional forces, if you don't have the means to outmatch them, is to build up your conventional forces. And if you're not able to do that, then it's perhaps better to negotiate and to seek a compromise. Obviously, in the latter case, if the other side is amenable to a compromise. The Russians, like the Chinese, are amenable to a compromise in Europe. Putin and other Russian officials have said repeatedly that they have red lines, core interests, that they wish to defend. They want the United States to accept and acknowledge those red lines. These red lines include no further NATO expansion into the territories of the former Soviet Union, certainly not into Ukraine, and arguably not into Georgia or Moldova either. By implication, no EU expansion into these territories, and a end of Western attempts to destabilise the government, the situation in Belarus, and to seek some kind of regime change in Moscow. If the United States and the Western powers were to accept that, then tensions in Europe 
would relax. But we see how impossible politically this is. And we see how the situation instead is creating further problems for the United States and for NATO down the road. Because as it is politically impossible for the administration in Washington to face down the hardliners, both in Washington and in Europe, both over the Pacific and over the Atlantic, they find themselves instead on a mounting escalator of commitments which they cannot honour and strategies which simply invite disaster. I wonder how much longer this is going to go on for. I've said previously that we're going to be, before very long, faced with a major crisis, perhaps sometime in the mid-2020s, perhaps a little later in the late 2020s, or perhaps 2030, or but sometime before long, we will be seeing a major strategic commitments crisis with the United States facing uh, a situation where it really can't keep up any longer or even pretend to keep up with the growth of Chinese and Russian military power. It can try to enlist allies to try to keep itself in the game, but those allies will only provide limited amount of help. Even a country like Japan simply doesn't have the resources in the end to make, over the long term, a major difference. And I come back to what I've said. Rather than engaging in these reckless and foolish plans, which can only make the situation for the United States and its NATO allies worse, why not seek that geostrategic ceasefire with the Chinese and the Russians? It's there for the taking. It's not a problem. No core interest of the United States or of the NATO alliance, or of any of the US's allies, would be threatened or compromised as a result. The Baltic states would be unhappy. Poland, or at least the government there, would be extremely unhappy. But realistically, why is the United States concerned about their larger feuds with Russia, as opposed to securing their security, as could be done if that geostrategic ceasefire with Russia were negotiated. It seems extraordinary to me that the United States should find itself being led along by the East Europeans in their sort of way. Why should the United States get itself into a position where it's having to make commitments that it cannot honour to the Europeans in exchange for support from them they cannot provide in terms of the confrontation with China in the Pacific when the United States anyway lacks the resources to take on China over the long term in the Pacific. This looks like an extremely bad and ill thought out strategy to me. Well, I don't know where all this is going to end. End badly, I expect. But in any event, we're now seeing the nature of the strategic crisis that's developing. Well, more about this, no doubt, shortly. I've provided um, an article about all of this uh, um, um, ab by a person called Joe, Joe Gould, which illustrates some of the points I'm mati making. It says Russia fears, comp uh, fears, Russia fears complicate NATO's new China focus and it's drawn from the Associated Press, and you can read some of the points there, which illustrate some of the points I've been making. Anyway, I look forward to you joining me um, in future programmes on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo. And also, please remember to check out Alex's channel, uh, which you will find links to under this video. But I would also uh, ask you or to please consider joining us also on Locals. you find all the information from all our channels gathered together there. You'll also find exclusive content that we publish increasingly on Locals. 
and don't publish elsewhere. And you'll also find active uh, material, uh, material there that's published by our very active and very uh, vibrant Duran community. Last week, as I've said, I did my first live stream on Locals. I'm intending to do another live stream this week. I haven't yet fixed definitely on the time. There's lots of things that I have to do uh, this week which uh, make it rather difficult to sort out a schedule, but I will be providing notice on Locals before I do that live stream. So if you want to join us there, you can, and you want to join my live, you can see from Locals when it's coming and can join, and if you choose, participate in it also. And of course, it's not just on Locals where you can find us, we're also on BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, and on the new free speech platform, SuperU. And um, also, if you want to support us, you can support us by joining us by, by through Patreon and Subscribestar, and by going to our shop, buying the amazing things that you will find there, our amazing Duran magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our long-sleeved t-shirts, our um, ordinary t-shirts and all the rest. I would say that when we set up our shop, we made a decision to go for go in for high quality, very high quality goods. All our t-shirts, for example, are 100% cotton. Our magic mugs are beautifully made and, well, practically indestructible. I should know I'm a huge fumbler and have broken many mugs in my time. And I've owned Duran mugs now for, well, at least two years, and I've never broken any. So they are extremely good quality things, and you can buy them if you come to our shop. Also, please do remember to check your subscription to this channel. There have been some strange stories about things that have happened to people's subscriptions, and please remember to tick the like button if you like this video. Thank you for joining me again today on this channel. I look forward to you joining me again soon, and have a wonderful day until then.